over the time I've talked about it many times. Sure. Um, okay, hello everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Professor Sarah Rokheimer. Um, so Sarah is a professor at North University, just a little north of here, um, and is visiting us today for the rest of the afternoon. Um, before she was at York, she was a postdoc at Oxford and St. Andrews, um, and also has like a bunch of named things <laughs> on her CV, um, very impressive uh, exoplanet and astrobiology researcher, uh, and also an amazing public speaker and has a TED talk and some other cool art stuff. So <laughs> um, without further ado, I'll hand things over to Sarah. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, so please feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you'd like, and we can just have a conversation about astrobiology and how it intersects with astronomy, and really you know, use this opportunity to ask the wild, the weird, the crazy, and we'll, we'll see where, where this goes. Um, so how I, let's see if this will, my pointer is not working. Um, how I got into uh, this field is I'm really interested in this question. Are we alone in the universe? Who thinks we're alone in the universe? Who doesn't think we're alone in the universe? How are we going to figure it out, though? That's the hard part, and that's why I got interested in this field. And I often think when I give public talks, you know, the public thinks we're finding Pandora. You know, I'm pretty sure they think we've already found Pandora. We're hiding the bodies at Area 51 or whatever, and the UFO hearings and whatever person claims to have seen alien bodies. That's what people think, right? Uh, this is what I think, you know, and how I like to present it. You know, I'm like, we'll find it. Can you see the, the contrast? It's pretty bad on this screen. You know, is that better? Yeah. yeah. One more. I mean, I don't want everyone to fall asleep. That's the problem. It's like post lunch and darkness. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, so this is what theorists like myself claim we're going to find. Look at this spectra. No error bars. You know, so that's the sort of paper that I write. And uh, really, what we're going to find is something more like this a pale blue pixel. You know, there's going to be error bars, and maybe multiple models are going to fit the data, and it's going to be difficult to disentangle what we're trying to see. So the way I like to frame this problem is that there's two hurdles that we really need to try to overcome over the next few decades as we try to uh, find life on other planets. The first is just this technological hurdle. Can we make the detection, say, of oxygen in an exoplanet atmosphere? The second hurdle is what does that oxygen mean? Is it life? Is it not life? So there's two different sorts of problems behind each of those. So when we think about you know, the Earth and solar system planets, we know so much you know, about our own planet. We can have these giant 3D models and figure out lots of cool stuff about you know, exactly like ocean currents and circulation models and whatnot. But with exoplanets, we know their size and radius, you know, their mass and radius to maybe 20% if that. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> we don't know very much about exoplanets at this time. We're starting to figure out more. And so you know, we have lots of data about the solar system objects. Um, and then we have a little bit of data about thousands of exoplanets, you know, 5,000 exoplanets or so, so far. And so these exoplanets and us figuring out more about them will provide the statistical con uh, context for understanding our own solar system as well as life in the universe. Um, so we've been finding planets for a long time. Uh, has everyone in this room been alive since we've been <laughs> has anyone, is anyone at that level? Okay, like, I was in high school, but, you know, maybe some of you uh, were not yet born when we found the first planets in uh, 1992, 1995, depending on uh, what you consider that to be that first discovery. Then we are now entering the James Webb Space Telescope era, right, where we have, uh, we're starting to actually get things about their atmospheres. This is water and a, a hot Jupiter and, and uh, carbon dioxide in these planets. Uh, James Webb will be great for this, but not really for the small planets. You know, maybe it's right at the edge of what James Webb can do. So, you know, you're going to have much bigger error bars on your data, but hopefully with enough hours and telescope time, we'll be able to figure this out 
for a handful of planets. So mostly what James Webb is going to be doing is these sorts of mini Neptunes, uh, Jupiter-sized planets, and really figuring out what's in the atmospheres of those. And we're probably going to be able to get mm, like six-ish planets or something that are more rocky habitable in the Hubble zone. Uh, so that's like much more difficult with James Webb. So the only reason why I got into astronomy, though, is I want to find signs of life before I die. You know, I really did not otherwise care about astronomy when I started to go into this field. So um, what we need to look forward. Uh, so then we have the Hubble Worlds Observatory uh, with NASA and my favorite mission, which is the LIFE mission. Who's heard of LIFE? Anyone? Anyone? You weren't on my talk this summer? Okay. <laughs> See that in this very room. Um, we are trying to fly uh, a, the large interferometer for exoplanets, we back did that acronym, um, LIFE, to see if we can do uh, biosignatures in the infrared for a larger sample size. And so LIFE is this mission, um, you might have heard about the TPFI, the Terrestrial Planet Finder in the Infrared, this long ago mission concept which has long since been canceled. Darwin was the European version, if you may have heard that. These two are kind of now the modern version of this uh, mission concept is LIFE, Large Interferometer for Exoplanets. It's mainly um, out of ETH Zurich, uh, and I'm part of the, the uh, mission team, and we're hoping for something in the, you know, the 2040s. Um, but LIFE is a mission that is, why it's exciting, and we'll get to kind of the pros and cons of visible versus infrared, uh, but it will look in the infrared with um, a large enough sample size that even the null result would be interesting, uh, where we're hoping to get uh, around 30 to 50 planets with uh, rocky, uh, rocky compositions and receiving insulation that is uh, corresponding to the uh, classical habitable zone. So um, I've been a part of this mission from the beginning, and I co-lead the project office with Daniel Eigerhausen, and Sasha Quantz is the fearless PI of this mission, and we're really trying to get that off the ground. Uh, feel free to sign up for you know the news uh, newsletter and mailing list if it's something you want to get involved in. There's also other science. So if you think of you know, not exoplanets, you would love to have a, a nulling interferometer in space, though. Uh, we have a whole team dedicated to trying to figure out what other science we can do with this telescope. But basically, life is, uh, say, four, two to three and a half meter um, uh, telescopes in space in formation flying uh, to then do nulling interferometry to directly image and get uh, the infrared spectra of the habitable planets. And uh, there, it's really complementary to uh, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which NASA has selected. So here in the top panel, we have the visible and near infrared spectra. This is more or less the, the region that uh, that Habitable Worlds Observatory will look at. And then you have the infrared here, which is what life would be, would be doing, uh, probably from like you know, four, maybe three, but probably from four microns on. And uh, so you just get different features from both, and you can learn uh, different aspects of the planet. And so here you can see this uh, top panel is the LIFE mission. This bottom one is the Howell Worlds Observatory. And you can see where can we constrain different aspects of the planet. So here are some uh, gases that we might want to figure out uh, the habitability and if there's uh, life in that planet as well as the radius, the pressure, surface pressure, and surface temperature. So um, habitable worlds uh, can't really get a good estimate of the surface uh, temperature. It's gonna really struggle to get methane um, and CO2, uh, whereas life does give you those things, but we can't get oxygen. We can't get O2. We can get ozone, which is the proxy for oxygen. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So there is like widespread community agreement that this is sort of a direction that we might want to be moving in the next few decades. And so this uh, just shows you the 2015 poll versus the 2020 poll, and then a green is an increase and a red is a decrease in uh, interest in these fields where we think uh, the uh, areas of astrophysics research will be uh, important in the next decade, in the 2030s. And search for life outside Earth and planet system formation and evolution has gotten a huge uh, increase in interest from the 2015 to the 2020 poll. 
So, um, yeah, we have this technological hurdle. Can we actually even detect these molecules in an extracellular planet? And so we have, of course, James Webb right now and Ariel later um, in this decade, and then kind of on the horizon would be Life as Habitable Worlds um, Observatory. And of course, we also have these large ground-based observatories coming online in the 2020s as well, such as the ELT with METIS. And there's really uh, trade-offs between these two uh, classes of missions. So in space, you have lower resolution, but you can uh, get the abundance of the molecule because you're able to, to get the line profile. Uh, whereas from the ground, you are uh, forced to use high resolution in order to see through our own atmosphere. Um, but then uh, we really can just see the presence rather than the abundance of those molecules. Um, and so that's kind of like the pros and cons between the two of them. Why? Hmm? Why? I don't understand. I feel like I'm missing something. Why can't you measure abundances from your high resolution spectrum? Um, because you can't, uh, because you're going through Earth's atmosphere and you have to separate the lines like to a resolution of 100,000 or something, and you just aren't, it's like much harder. There, are, There's like efforts to try to see could we get uh, uh, some way to constrain the abundance, uh, but it's very, I haven't seen really a good way to do it from the ground. So you're just seeing, just, and I have some. the problem of the atmosphere. Yeah, and, and then trying to, yeah. and then you have to have this super high resolution spectrum, which yeah. you can't bend you know, to, to get um, the line profile. And, and so that means that, um, what, what's great about it though is you can see more minor molecules and even isotopes, which we'll, we'll get to, which is uh, crazy, you know, to think about. But, uh, so high resolution does a different sort of science. Um, yeah, so what we um, are looking at is how I uh, view this, is we have this first opportunity in this decade. You know, we're in the decade. Yeah, I just want to come back to that point. Isn't it Earth moving at like 30 kilometers per second speed? Yeah, you also have to factor that in. Yeah. But shouldn't that help you in terms of... Uh... The, the, the atmosphere is fixed in the... the yeah, the atmosphere yeah. lines are moving. Well, you also okay. have to factor that in. Yeah. 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 Yes, so you have to factor in all of those motions of Earth around and our sun as well as... I don't think it helps you get the abundance. Um, but the uh, uh, you do need to factor that in when you're then figuring out what the Doesn't Doppler shift is of those high resolutions. Does the telescope move to account for that? Uh, you're focusing on the... Uh, no, but the, the Earth's line is fixed to us. Oh, I see. Moving, yeah, we're moving, moving and then you have to factor out that velocity. Yeah. So you think that would help humanity behind the resolution? Maybe it's just like, so this is an area that's slightly outside my area of expertise, but I, I imagine it's also like you don't have the signal, you know, with like, especially with these. But that's um, why I think it's not as help. Yes. So with something like ELT and METIS, we're barely able to do Earth-like planets, and it would be impossible, I think, to even do um, Earths with GMT or TMT. You really need like that 40, near 40 meter uh, exposure. So. So really, the ELT with Metis is like the, the only one that would be for Earth-like planets, you know. But of course, uh, other ones can do it for, you know, hot Jupiters and, and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, so, so this is this first opportunity to uh, make these uh, detections, but they're not going to give us the full answer, I don't think, because there's going to be so few targets that they're able to do, whereas the 25-year horizon uh, with something like Habitable Worlds Observatory and Life hopefully will provide us that statistical sample size where we can start to tease out um, uh, whether a planet is kind of anomalous in its atmosphere and, and might have life. Um, this is just uh, a fun little uh, side sideway into Pluto over the ages. You know, so we have Pluto in the 1930s. This is from the Lowell Observatory. Um, and then Hubble Space Telescope in 1994, and then after improvements to the Hubble Space Telescope in 2003, um, you know, and then if we look now, of course, it's a little unfair as a flyby, but we can see snow-capped mountains on Pluto, you know. Um, so within 100 years, that's, that's our, uh, our resolution of, of, of Pluto. Um, and what I'm most interested in after we kind of solve these inter uh, technological hurdles is, of course, this interpretation hurdle. That's going to be really hard. So uh, there's also maybe you've seen this picture before, the face on Mars, Cydonia region. Have you ever seen this one? Yeah? Um, taken by uh, Viking in 1976, and people are like, oh, man. 
Uh, but if you just have a higher resolution image of it, the, the face goes away, you know? Um, and I think honestly, this kind of explains a little, you know, it's just really low resolution. Um, and if we had higher resolution, uh, then it would be more obvious what's happening there. But when there's low resolution, you can dream into it, whatever you want, you know, into the data. And so of course, you know, this famous quote by uh, Feynman that science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool, you know, because like, I want to find life on another planet. So I have to be extra skeptical of, of my interpretation of that. Um, this image, of course, is going to be difficult to interpret. As I mentioned, for, for Earth-like planets, it's just going to be this pale blue pixel. Uh, and so probably there's only one type of detection that would be completely unambiguous. And that's a sort of, you know, hello, Earthlings, we are here. Uh, let's beam you a prime number sequence. Then we know we found life. Uh, but otherwise, is we're going to be dealing with probabilities and trying to figure out, is there something else that could create these signals? Well, why don't you look for that? Well, we are. I mean, obviously, Sunny is looking for that. Why don't I? Yeah. Um, because, okay, you think uh, a number of reasons, but we've only been sending out, say, signals that can go appreciable distances for, you know, 100 years. Um, Earth life has had uh, detectable signatures from light years away for at least 2 billion years, if not longer. Um, just from a sheer numbers and probability perspective of how easy it is to detect microbial life compared to uh, intelligent life, I think our chances are much higher of detecting uh, microbial life. And so that's actually the title of my TED talk, The Search for Microscopic Aliens, because I'm, you know, I'm into the little microbes you know, that we could find. I think that would be incredibly exciting. Um, and they dominate our uh, biosphere on Earth. You know, like you yourself are half human cells and roughly half microbes. Um, so are you human? Are you like a walking <laughs> organism host for the microbial community you have? Right? Uh, the Earth's biosphere is dominated by microbes and leave the strongest imprint in the atmosphere. Uh, so that's why I'm interested in it. So, uh, so that's what my research area then is. I'm really interested in this intersection between uh, the stellar activity, stellar environment, planetary atmospheres and how life um, is also playing a role, and in particular, how the UV uh, influences all of these areas. So um, there's two broad ways of searching for alien life. You know, there's looking for life as we know it, looking for signatures that Earth-like produces, um, and gases that we might be able to detect in uh, an extrasolar planet atmosphere. So that's things like oxygen, ozone, methane, uh, dimethyl sulfide, ammonia, um, and, and other things. Then there's the all small molecules approach, which was uh, uh, put forth by Sarah Seeger, um, alumni of Toronto. And she said, well, let's consider all molecules that could be produced by life and which ones are stable and volatile and could, uh, could be in the atmosphere and which ones have detectable uh, spectra and, and could we detect those. Um, so let's think about this a little bit because I think it's an interesting question, you know. So we could look for alternative biosignatures and, and this is great in the sense it's not Earth-centric. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't expect life to evolve the same way on every, on every planet. Um, so it's where we can try to not be so Earth-centric in our thinking, that would be awesome. However, um, the problem with not being Earth-centric is we have no idea what those biosignatures are. You know, we, we don't know if those alternative biochemistries exist because uh, we're such at our infancy of even understanding Earth-like life and what sort of signatures could be detected. So it's very difficult to try to uh, imagine what those are. And where I'd say is even where I'm more pessimistic about this approach is we can't even tell if there's life in our backyard. You know, if Titan is a habitable environment, we have no idea what the biosignatures on Titan would be. Uh, and we have good spectra of Titan's atmosphere, you know? Um, same with uh, Europa, Mars, and et cetera. Like, we don't know if life is there or Venus. Uh, and so <coughs> and these are places we've like sent landers or orbiters or visited. So as an exoplanet target, they're just not really relevant to us at this point. Um, however, this is absolutely why I think we need to do a lot of solar system exploration. I 100% think we should go to Venus and should go to Titan. Um, we should uh, go into the subsurface on Mars and try to get below the ice 
cheetah and gorilla and see if those environments have life. And then hopefully, if, especially these two, which are so different from Earth, like these are fairly similar to Earth, but Titan and Europa are so different from Earth, if they do have a living uh, system, then we can start to look at what are those biosignatures, what's being produced that's different from just geology alone on that planet and try to figure out how to tease that out uh, as an exoplanet. But we're not quite there yet. Um, we could also look for unique biosignatures. So these are things like methyl chloride, chlorofluorocarbons, dimethyl sulfide. Um, the advantage here is there's no known false positives for these molecules. Um, the cons are that they're usually rare and limited to a single microbial species. Sort of evolutionary quirk, maybe evolved for sing signaling or something like that. They're not a main metabolic pathway. And so they're only produced in very small quantities, you know, and we don't have spectra for most of the molecules that could exist. Yeah. Yeah, so what does it mean, no known possibly possible? Is that an idea that for Earth uh, geology, we don't produce that, or like in general, we don't think there's a geological pathway for that? Yeah. So, um, and this, this gets to a really interesting question, say, about uh, some of these, like dimethyl sulfide. You probably maybe heard in the news um, about it being a potentially maybe a tantalizing hint of this found on, was it K218B? Um, did you guys see that paper earlier this year? Yeah. Um, so on Earth, dimethyl sulfide is only produced by life. But in an, in an environment that's totally different than Earth, which this one is a hydrogen dominated planet atmosphere, uh, you might have dimethyl sulfide produced by not life, right? So it's like, so you kind of need to know something about the planet um, and its conditions. And then uh, we can't think of a way to produce that gas. So um, without life uh, on Earth, uh, we'll get to this point later down, but you can definitely produce oxygen without life um, depending on the environmental conditions you have. And so that, that is a known false positive mechanism. And so what we would like to do, it would be great if we could find something, like this is chlor fluorocarbons, they're um, a pollutant, you know, they're not produced by non-living systems. Uh, so if you found that, you'd be like, oh, you know, they're running, you know, refrigerators or whatever it is that, that, that makes this, right? So that's sort of the no false positives. Uh, but with that, I think we do need to be careful because things like dimethyl sulfide, we're not really sure of all the production mechanisms in an environment that's very different from Earth, you know. Um, but be that as it may, like, we don't even have spectra for most of these molecules to be able to find them in other planets. Uh, and this is a big problem. So of the 16,000 possible molecules that life could produce, uh, we only have spectra of inequality for about 0.04% of those molecules. Uh, so we just won't even be able to see them. Yeah, quite nice. Why is that? Um, so most of the molecules that we have lines for are things that are in Earth's atmosphere in high abundance and at Earth uh, pressures and temperatures. So just a lot of these molecules have never, this spectra has never been uh, uh, found for them or, or either experimentally uh, found or uh, like through quantum chemistry calculations uh, calculated. So there's a group uh, exomol in the UK that's making a high quality line list for some of these molecules, but it takes like four years to do one molecule. And so maybe with machine learning and whatnot, we'll actually make a much bigger headway. I think we're gonna see this change. Uh, but right now we just don't have the lines. Uh, when you said those. experiments, you meant terrestrial experiments, right? Like, yeah, so like gas chamber, yeah. like gas chamber experiments and stuff. And then of course, like uh, often you don't wanna put things that are flammable or dangerous in a gas chamber. So then sometimes it's just hard to get uh, some combinations of gases that you might uh, see just due to like safety concerns as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so you know, we took this little brief foray into trying to find not Earth-like life, but now we're kind of back to searching for Earth-like life, you know, because there's these hurdles um, in trying to figure out uh, the non-Earth type like, like signatures. But I, I think there's like reasons to hope for actually finding Earth-like life from a chemistry perspective. So one thing is water and CO2 are everywhere we look in the universe, right? They're just, they're so abundant. Um, carbon's more ab abundant than silicon, it forms more complex chemistry. Water is polar and has unusual properties and it's literally everywhere we look. 
Uh, so there's a good reason to like start with those as uh, habitability markers and constituent molecules for what a, a lot of Earth like life uses. So the pros for searching for Earth like life is we might understand what we see, you know. Um, and here, this question I always get, so I want, I want you to take this little nugget home with you because it's something that people always ask. Why oxygen? Why are we so focused on oxygen? Well, oxygenic photosynthesis uses light, CO2, and water, right? These are all abundant in this sort of any planetary like environment, you know, certainly on Earth. And because these are so abundant, oxygenic photosynthesis is the single most successful biomass building product on Earth. You know, um, methanogenesis, where you say you need hydrogen, there's just less hydrogen, you know, on Earth. So you have less methanogenesis and whatnot. Um, so even though this is a more complex uh, metabolism, it took a little longer to evolve, it became wildly successful because the constituent molecules that go into it and the source of energy is so abundant. So I think it's reasonable to think that that would uh, evolve on another planet because, again, photons, CO2, and water are very common in the universe. Of course, there's no shortage of places to look. And you know, we have 40 billion Earth-like planets or so in our galaxy alone. Um, and so we can certainly start to look in Earth-like habitable environments. The cons, of course, are all of these classical biosignatures, and we'll get more into this, have known false positives. You can't rely on them uh, I, I, uniquely for life. Um, and so that means we need to detect multiple gases, try to really understand the planetary context, that becomes expensive. You know, you're looking at like two huge place, uh, space missions, right? That are they're going to be expensive, um, and still we could be fooled. You know, we can't visit the planet, take a photo of like alien kangaroos jumping around. It's going to be quite difficult to do this from just this uh, noisy spectra with error bars. You know, and a fuzzy tail blue dot. Now, all the when we go to talk about the false positives, these are strongest for M dwarfs. The UV environment is vital, and we really can only understand the planet as well as we understand the star. So that's where we're going to go for this next part. Um, just kind of thinking a little bit about the physics of what goes into modeling planetary atmospheres. This is a picture from Earth climate. Uh, so you can see we have this incoming solar radiation. Some of it's reflected by clouds, you know, back into uh, space. You know, some is absorbed by the surface, some is reflected by the surface. Uh, and then you have what's absorbed by the surface, you have it re-radiated out, you have your greenhouse gases, um, uh, you know, reabsorbate some of that, and then uh, you have what escapes to space, right? So that's sort of the two parts that go into your climate on Earth. This stuff makes the visible part of the spectrum, that stuff makes the infrared part of the spectrum, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about it. So when we look at Earth spectrum here, we have the sun, we have this is visible, uh, visible light by this rainbow here, uh, and this is Earth spectrum. We have these two humps. This is the thermal emission, that infrared. This is the reflected light, the visible part of the spectrum. And uh, in the reflected light, we have the strong oxygen signature. We have a lot of water features, but we don't have a lot of these other molecules like methane and CO2 and whatnot. So that's why also we're excited about the infrared. Um, and, you know, the, the contrast ratio of how many photons you have from your star to the planet for, say, an Earth-Sun analog is 10 billion in the visible, where it's a million in, in the infrared. So it's just, like, more favorable for that. So um, just to give you a sense of kind of, like, the machinery behind some of these models that you're going to now see from my work, um, if we, we can use a climate code, imagine you have a fixed chemistry, so you know exactly what the heating, what the greenhouse gases are in each layer of the atmosphere, uh, and you know what the radiation that's coming in the top of the atmosphere, you can then calculate what uh, the temperature, pressure, and water is at each layer. So, um, you know, water you can calculate, assuming you have a surface reservoir, just by evaporation. You know, if it's a warmer, you're going to be evaporated. Uh, once you have that temperature and pressure profile, the altitude profile, you can then use that as an input and calculate any updates to the abundances, the mixing ratios of those molecules. So for example, um, you'll have different sort of kinetic reaction rates depending on the temperature of that layer 
Uh, and so you can go back and forth between these two codes to iterate to a stable solution, basically, as you update the temperature pressure profile. This might change the abundance of some of these molecules at certain layers in the atmosphere. That might change the heating that happens in the atmosphere, et cetera. You know, you go back and forth. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, from that, this is kind of like the, the physics and chemistry of what's happening in your atmosphere. Now, we as astronomers, we want to figure out what can we see from light years away. Yeah. So then we put this into like a line by line radio transfer code and you can get out your nice uh, spectra to see what, what you would be able to hopefully see with your uh, telescope. So what I'm interested in when I think about modeling atmospheres is what kind of wavelengths should we be focused on to be able to tease out these signatures? What resolution of a telescope will we need? What's the minimum resolution? Same with life, that's a lot of our work right now. Um, like how how cheap can we go with this mission and still be able to get the answer we want? And of course, how big of a telescope do you need? Um, when you're spending that kind of money, you want to make sure that you can actually make the observation that you claim. Um, and then my particular area that I focus on is how does the star impact the atmosphere spectral uh, features and biosignatures? So, UV. UV does uh, many things to biosignatures. For example, it can destroy biosignatures like methane. Uh, UV uh, is uh, one of the main destruction pathways of methane and that makes it harder to see in the atmosphere of a UV active star. Uh, but UV also produces biosignatures like ozone. It's from the uh, photolysis of oxygen that we get ozone and we can uh, see that biosignature. Why, why, sorry, this is a very question. Yeah. Why is that a biosignature? Ozone? If there's just oxygen. I mean, is the claim that it needs to be, like, for there to be oxygen abundance? No, but we're going to go a lot more in detail into oxygen as a biosignature and the pros and cons. The short answer of why, why should we even care about oxygen at all is that all of our 21% of oxygen comes from life. You know, the abiotic sources on Earth are very minimal, and photochemical production is very minimal. Um, however, we can envision waste where that's higher. Um, so, uh, but, you know, also, if you're interested in UV, the ratio of far UV to near UV matters too. It's not just like how much UV, uh, like bulk luminosity you have. You want to know kind of where is the UV. So you have, um, you know, say the production of ozone needs far UV photons in order to uh, proceed. Whereas the destruction of ozone can happen with near UV photons as well. So having a balance between um, how much near uh, UV is in your far UV and near UV will determine uh, sort of the interplay between those uh, species in your atmosphere. When we think about uh, FGKM stars, uh, F stars, for example, have high amounts of near UV radiation because their black body um, is still in the UV. Uh, and so you, you have a lot of near UV, but very little far UV uh, relatively. And then as you go to M stars, you have very low near UV. Um, it's more similar to, uh, you know, because the black body is peaking more in the red, but they do have strong line emissions and really strong far UV and a much higher balance of far UV compared to near UV in, in those stars. So let's take a little uh, brief interlude into M stars because, uh, you know, they're the first uh, targets that we'll be looking at. You know, when we think about all the stars within uh, 10 parsecs of Earth, it's around, you know, 75% are M stars. And we've also learned that from Kepler that roughly 25% of M stars have a habitable planet. So this is, of course, where people are going to look first for those uh, signatures. As well, due to um, the relative size of the planet compared to the star, their transit depth is much larger for um, the same planet size compared to a G star. And especially for transmission spectra, they, um, the habitable zone is so much closer in to an M star such that they're transiting, say, in the habitable zone every 10 to 20 days or so. Uh, and then you can actually add up that spectra over time. So you need 200 hours of observation, the transit's 10 hours. You can do that reasonably around an M star, whereas for uh, uh, Earth uh, analog, it's impossible with transit because you'd have to like wait 20 years for something like that to get to get all your uh, observational time added up uh, with it only transiting once every year. The main problem with M stars that people have pointed out is they have strong flares and they remain active for much longer periods of time it's not clear that it even have stable atmospheres uh, or thin atmospheres. 
Earth-like atmospheres. So um, when we look at uh, M stars, this is like active lifetime in billions of years on the y-axis, and this is the uh, M star spectral class. You can see that even the hotter M stars, the earlier M stars, are active for one to two billion years. For reference, our sun is active for half a billion years, so it's still much longer. And then around uh, when they have this fully convective boundary um, around M4, uh, they start to remain active for, you know, six to eight billion years, which is longer than Earth has been around. Um, these stars are remaining active. Uh, so, so that's uh, one, one major consideration. So if we compare just two extremes, this is like a toy model. It's not really necessarily representative of any real system. But if we look at uh, Earth-like planet, so the same outgassing fluxes, the same fluxes from life and volcanoes and everything as Earth, and we just put it around an M5 star, uh, one with like uh, a more active UV uh, environment and one with like no UV, basically uh, photosphere only UV. And you can see in this case, just by changing the UV photons, you get entirely different molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, so this is the same planet, the same uh, uh, fluxes into the atmosphere, but what is dominant in the atmosphere changes and what the spectra changes based on what the UV is. So the UV really matters for like determining what your ultimate spectra will be. Yeah. Um, also, when we think about M stars, here's the list of known false positives for oxygen. We're asking about this. Um, you can make oxygen without life, and these are some ways to do it. You know, uh, when you have, I'll go through this one more in detail, superluminous pre-main sequence uh, M star, or you have a lack of a cold trap and your water gets lofted up in the stratosphere and gets photolyzed. Um, CO2 photolysis, you're at the inner edge of the halo zone, or you're a really dry planet. And so these um, are the known false positives for oxygen and ozone. Most of them are most prevalent for M dwarfs. So these ones primarily happen around M dwarfs, and all of them depend on the UV environment of the host star. All of, all of these oxygenic uh, photolysis mechanisms are driven by UV. So this is why I focus a lot on UV. So let's walk through one of them as kind of an example, so you hopefully understand that. So say we have this pre-main sequence superluminous M star, and it has a lot of extreme UV that breaks apart water uh, in that uh, planet environment into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is light and it escapes, and then you're left behind with the oxygen in the atmosphere. Some of it will, of course, react with the surface, and uh, some of it may stay in the atmosphere. And then you could have, like, if you were just looking for oxygen as a sign of life, you could be fooled. Now, in this case, you would see the absence of water as well. So uh, one way to mitigate against this is by looking for water and oxygen, for example. Um, but if you were to just look as a sig single gas, you know, say we found oxygen, you don't necessarily know whether that's life or not. Um, on Earth, uh, as, as we've talked a little bit about, all of our oxygen comes from life. You know, all 21 percent, as well as most of our methane, uh, by far the majority of it comes from life, uh, from microbes living in anaerobic environments like the intestinal tracts of cows or rice paddies, etc. Uh, but you know, you could see how you could get oxygen or ozone by breaking apart water or CO2, uh, and you can get methane from volcano circondization from geology alone. So if a planet was much more geologically active, you could have more methane. So that uh, either of these gases alone is not a good biosignature. However, if you um, see them both together, that's a really strong indicator. And so this um, is one of the very first biosignatures ever pro proposed is this oxidizing plus reducing gas. Uh, I think this was initially proposed in the 60s um, as being the strongest indicator of life on Earth. And indeed, if an alien astronomer were looking at Earth, they would see you know, oxygen and methane. And that would be a, an indicator that it's not happening from geology. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, we, we can see both of those gases. So the UV really matters um, to our understanding of biosignatures. Um, 
And let's now like look at oxygen and other biosignatures through geological time over billions of years. What can we see? So um, Earth as an exoplanet. One thing is we often think of Earth in its modern context, but Earth has evolved for billions of years and has represented many types of planets over its time. And so here is a um, like graph of potentially uh, molecules at different parts of Earth's history. You can see there's a wide error range, on, especially as we go back in history, whereas of course closer to modern times, this is modern time and going back in time, uh, then we have better constraints on the abundance in the atmosphere. Um, and so if we like say take a few points of like a prebiotic planet after the first rise of oxygen and the second rise of oxygen in modern Earth, we can see how the spectra changes around different uh, star types. So if we do that and we look at how far back in time could we see an Earth-like biosignature uh, combination around different stars. So here we have uh, black as the F stars and going up to the red lines, you're going down to cooler stars. This uh, top panel is your prebiotic infrared spectra. And now I'm going to like add the other epoch. So here's after we have the first rise of oxygen with the great oxidation event. Um, that's now 1% of our current concentrations of oxygen. Then we had a further uh, jump in oxygen at the near Proterozoic. And then finally our modern concentration. Oxygen really changes a lot of the chemistry of what's happening in the atmosphere, which is why we're focusing on that. Um, and what I want you to, to highlight is like here, if we look at ozone, first thing that worries me a little bit is ozone really overlaps with the CO2 line. So when there's a lot of CO2 in an atmosphere, it's going to be harder to see that ozone feature. Um, then, uh, like if there's not a lot of CO2 though, it's great because already for some of these hotter star types with uh, lots of UV, we have really strong signatures of ozone, even though there's very low oxygen concentrations at that time. And uh, like, remember I was saying that oxygen or ozone plus methane is the strongest biosignature gas. So detecting those two features together would be possible for some star types for like, you know, billions of years. Um, and then for the next rise of oxygen, we start to get a better ozone feature for more host stars. And then for modern Earth, we have it for more stars, but we have less methane because uh, the ozone and oxygen uh, will destroy the methane in the atmosphere. So uh, we can also then put these through the life simulator to see like could life uh, detect these and, and how well. And so we put these models um, through that and tried to see what can we simulate, can we see ourselves in time um, with the life mission. And here what we're looking at is these uh, posterior, so like a, a more of a you know, peak is going to indicate that you've constrained the abundance where this is like no constraint on the, on the uh, abundance. So we've constrained, 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 you know, not constrained, not constrained, you know, here, constrained here, not constrained, these two constrained here, that makes sense. Um, so we can see that we just really can't see uh, carbon monoxide and N2O, those are just low abundance. Uh, and then depending on the epoch, we can uh, start to constrain uh, methane um, and, and then CO2 is pretty easy to constrain. Uh, water is for most of the epochs and then uh, uh, ozone is for only the, the greater oxygenated atmospheres with life. How far away is this group? Uh, I think around 10 parsecs. So we can also try to see just like, I mean, it is actually really hard to even just see something like, is there water? As you can see, there's like not, not always, it's not always easy. And so one thing that um, I'm currently working on too is, can just life distinguish between a water rich and a water poor planet? Uh, so we again looked at um, putting models of different uh, abundances of water and what we see is for really high water planets, we can't really easily constrain the abundance. You know, there's a huge log range here. Uh, for these medium uh, levels of water, we're able to constrain it better. And then for low abundances, we're not able to constrain it better. And so what does this mean? You know, what we, um, 
we don't have a signature in the infrared that's uh, clearly a surface ocean. You might have heard of glint. Has anyone heard of glint? Yeah, you've probably seen it, you know, on, the, on a lake um, where you have a specular reflection at shallow angles of light. You can actually maybe see this in an exoplanet atmosphere, which is crazy to think. But that is one, one uh, signature that people are going to look for. That's in the visible. Uh, in the infrared, we're going to be looking for water vapor. And we're, as we found out, we're only really able to see water vapor in kind of these medium abundances of water, not when it's super high, not when it's super low. And so then uh, there's, um, so I talked to a geologist about this, and he was saying, well, that's probably what you want to see, because if you have a super high abundance of water in a steam atmosphere, you're on the way to like a runaway greenhouse sort of atmosphere. That's not really going to be your best place to, to for a habitable environment. And um, if there's water vapor present in the atmosphere, though, in these medium concentrations, that does likely indicate a surface ocean. Um, who has seen Dune? Yeah? Excited for Dune 2? Super excited. I went to see Dune 1 in IMAX yesterday because uh, they're replaying the, the, you know, the, the first Dune. And um, this uh, Jim Passing had mentioned Dune as an example where the water is um, in the rocks, right, in Dune. And that's what would happen. Like, water is going to react with your rocks. And so unless you have a surface ocean, you're not going to have a lot of humidity in the atmosphere. So by detecting the presence of water vapor, you are indicating this to a surface ocean. Um, so, uh, what does Glint look like spectrally? Sorry. Like, I, I, can, I can think of, like, resolving a planet and seeing a bright spot. Yeah, I think it's just like, like, mm, that's a good question. Um, you should invite Nick Cowan from Montreal, who I think has written the papers on Glint and, and would show you more what that is. Off, off the top of my head, I'm like, not sure. I think it's just an extreme brightness at the uh, uh, increase at like certain phases um, is my memory, but don't hold me to it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we'll see where we get in the next few minutes. I don't know if we just want to stop for questions or if I just keep going and you interrupt me, because we only have like nine minutes. Um, yeah, maybe you just keep going, but then there's time after the seminar for the okay. Right. All right. Yeah, feel free to feel free to stop me. We may not. We'll see where we get. Yeah. You know? um, but basically, in Earth's history, it's actually really hard to constrain. Um, oxygen, we can look for geology, like uh, ge uh, geographical markers, but you know, rocks are uh, metamorphosed uh, in that time and are harder to see. So I worked with this um, graduate student, who's, she's now a postdoc in Boulder, uh, to try to use 1D modeling to better constrain oxygen histories in Earth's atmosphere. And so we were able to make some uh, really cool results with that. And what uh, we had noticed is that a lot of the papers about uh, oxygen concentration, they just fix the amount and say, this is the amount of oxygen, what's the flux to give me that amount? And you can definitely make your model do that, like computationally, or like you can calculate that. However, that's not really what life would do, right? You'd expect life to increase, you know, a little bit more oxygen and photosynthesis, you have a bit more uh, flux from your surface, and then you know that's how you increase your concentration. And indeed, when you do that, what, uh, what Bethan found is that there's this whole range of oxygen mixing ratios that just don't occur. <laughs> that we have um, like a bistable state of oxygen abundance in our atmosphere due to some shielding effects um, as oxygen builds up in the atmosphere. And so, what this allows us to do is put um, some better constraints on oxygen in Earth's history. Um, and, and that's just helpful for us trying to figure out what the Earth's atmosphere looked like uh, over time. And so that was a nice intersection, I thought, of astronomy and this, uh, astrochemistry and how it uh, links with geology. Um, one thing also that we, uh, I looked at with another grad student um, is to see how well we can detect this oxygen, this main oxygen feature with the Louvoir Howell World's sort of observatory and the influence of clouds. Because clouds is a real bummer for a lot of observations, you know, they hide a lot of features. But oxygen's a really mix, well-mixed molecule, and it's uh, above the cloud layer. Um, 
you know, uh, in how it mixes in the atmosphere. So uh, if we look at like this is zero percent clouds all the way up to hundred percent clouds, and um, this is the like normalized spectra. So you can see the feature is decreasing in depth as you increase your clouds. But this top panel is actually like the signal you get, like the flux that you're getting, and you can see the signal is much bigger for more clouds. Basically, um, the clouds are reflective and help boost your signal. You know, with that, with the albedo of clouds. And so then when we calculate the integration time with uh, uh, Loire or Howell World Observatory for different oxygen concentrations in history, um, you know, starting back at, uh, you know, 100 to, you know, 10% to 50% and modern concentrations, we can see that, um, you know, you can see oxygen starting around this, uh, you know, 10% more easily, it would be pretty hard at the 1% level, but at this 10% of modern concentration, so that's 2.1% uh, oxygen in our atmosphere, you can see with tens of hours and then uh, much more easy as we get to modern concentrations. The main problem here, and I kind of hinted at this earlier, is um, Lou Voir, uh, isn't really able to detect methane well. And so if you have like modern abundances of methane, it's tens of thousands of hours to detect methane. The feature in the near infrared for Louvoir is just a very weak feature. And so you need a, a really high abundance of it in order to see it in, in the planetary uh, spectrum. All right, and so the last little thing I wanted to talk about is kind of just more, more weird molecules in the atmosphere of exoplanets. So um, there's this lovely quote from George Whitesides who said, it's a long way from slime to Mozart, which is very poetic. Um, but we actually know how to go from slime to Mozart pretty well, like through evolution. You know, it's uh, going from single cell to multicellular life, how the eye evolves and all that stuff. And this is a fairly well-trodden path. And so Steve Benner said, well, it's a long way from HCM to slime. You know, we don't really know how to go from just molecules to the first living cell. Um, that is that is difficult. Uh, but we do think HCN is a molecule that seems to be very important. And so some work that I've done is trying to look at these prebiotic signatures to see how well we can detect them and what kind of features create them and where they absorb. And so um, this is, I'm going to skip this slide because there's nothing you really need to know about this here or here, since I'm running out of time. But the short story is that HCN, which is thought to be really necessary for prebiotic chemistry, depends on how much UV radiation there is. It can enhance the abundance through flares, as well as the redox state of the, of the planet and what kind of outgassing molecules are uh, happening. And so uh, to try to detect HCN, to see if we can detect prebiotic molecules in an atmosphere, will depend on sort of what, how much HCN is, is being produced by that atmosphere. So we already did some calculations there um, where you can see the production changed by, you know, seven orders of magnitude or something, depending on how much methane and hydrogen you have in your uh, planetary atmosphere. So if we then look at this uh, for the early sun and 80 Leos and M star, these blue lines are just uh, water, methane, and CO2, those are the main species uh, that contribute to the spectrum on our planet. So if we have low hydrogen and methane and we increase hydrogen, now we're just increasing methane, boom, we start to see HCN and ethane in uh, the, the spectral lines. And then for high amounts of hydrogen and methane, we see a lot. However, unfortunately, it doesn't impact the low resolution spectra. You really need high resolution to see this because um, those features are overlapping so much like the CO2 feature, that they're just completely obscured by that. And so in order to do that, uh, we'd be looking, this is kind of going back to the very, some of the questions at the beginning. Uh, this is, you know, the, the carbon monoxide, uh, say in high resolution for, um, for an exoplanet and th these black lines are Earth's CO lines and then the uh, planet, if you factor out all our motion and you then just see the Doppler shift of the planet CO lines, you can uh, see the, the um, sinusoidal Doppler shift 
going across the spectra. And if there's a big enough separation of lines, you can, you can figure that out. Um, and so uh, you do this by, say, cross-correlation, where you have your high-resolution spectra, and you match your observations across a template, and you get a match, you've detected that molecule. So this has already been done to find, um, say, HCN and ammonia in a uh, high-resolution high spectrum of hot Jupiter. That's that transit mission high-resolution feature where it's uh, at that angle, you know, as part of the sinusoidal uh, part of that curve. And what I think is really cool about this is, uh, in my mind most, is we could actually maybe detect isotopes in exoplanet atmosphere. So Paul Moliere did this work. Um, he's now at MPIA in, in Germany. And the high-resolution spectra between C13O in orange and C12O in blue is different enough that you could tease it out with high-resolution spectra. Again, you can't get like the abundance between the two, but you can just detect its presence. And this is actually detectable potentially now with cryo-res plus. It, I think cryo-res is now finally back after a long hiatus from um, COVID. But you could maybe be able to detect heavy water, for example, in uh, Proxima Centauri B um, by using the ELT plus chronograph. So I think that's really exciting. And, and this is how we might be able to do that on like HCN on, a, on, a, on another planet, you know, to detect some of these more minor features. So as I mentioned also at the beginning, like for Earth to do high resolution for Earth and supers, you really do need the ELT with its near 40 meters um, of observation, I mean, of, of telescope size. And then we could maybe do the same disentangling. This is going back to those models of HCN in low resolution, you can't tease them out, but in high resolution, you have uh, different features that you might be able to see. So, um, you know, this is kind of coming to the end of my talk, but just to summarize, I think it's, you know, we have kind of two main hurdles that we need to deal with. One is just making these detections with these telescopes, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get some hints this decade, but I'm really excited about like kind of the two to three decade timeline. And then we're going to have to figure out what it, what it means, you know. We have these uh, terrestrial planets in our own solar system, they all have very different spectra. And we're going to get lots more spectra of terrestrial planets, hopefully, and they're going to look wild and weird and different, and we're going to have to figure it out. You know, there's many pathways to, to a planetary atmosphere to take. Earth is just one of them, and we have these biosignatures. You know, is phosphine a biosignature? Is ammonia plus hydrogen a biosignature? Maybe there could be lots of other weird stuff we don't really understand yet. Are there like failed biosignatures that like indicate the planet was on its way but never got fully into a, a biosphere? Who knows? But that's that's the sort of questions that I'm really excited about uh, learning and um, hopefully figuring out this question. But we'll, we'll end on a philosophical note, and I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts on this. If you can stay a few minutes. So even if we're not alone, will we be satisfied? You know, and especially like speak from your own perspective. You know, like if I'm talking about finding microbial life, you know, is that enough? Even finding uh, a ladybug, you know, that's a lot of billions of years of evolution, but you can't like talk to the ladybug. You can't like show them a photo on your iPhone and explain it to them, right? Like, like so is that is that gonna be exciting for you? Or do you really want that um, intelligent, uh, signal. Will we basically, even if we're not alone, could we still be lonely in the universe? All right, thank you. Uh, I'll say my opinion. I won't be satisfied. You won't be satisfied. I don't think humans are satisfied yeah. with these creatures. Uh, but I have a real question. Why do you want over 20 years to build? Why will it take over 20 years to uh, You mean for like building the telescopes? Yeah, yeah, you said like launch somewhere after 20 years. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, give me the $10 billion now and we'll do it faster. No but, that, that, that's <laughs> like, no, but that's my question. Is it like, is there some technology development pathway or it's more just like when you get the money? I think, I mean, I think all of these missions just have these long baselines for a number of reasons, right? Like one is, there is technolo technology readiness that needs to happen, which is mainly formation flying. Um, so we need to do that with smaller telescopes first and like demonstrate that uh, before just like launching a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, 
And then there's always delays. I mean, you know, James Webb had like what an 18 month delay because the fasteners weren't tightened. And then when it did the vibrational test, you know, the, the fasteners all, that was like half a billion dollar mistake. Okay. Someone screwed up. Yeah. 18 months from just not tightening some fasteners. So I don't know. I don't know if we can anticipate all the hurdles that are going to happen, but we know there's going to be hurdles. So I think some of it's like a money perspective. Like if, you know, I don't know if I were to convince like Elon Musk or whatever to just do this, would we do it faster? Probably. However, there's still going to be like hurdles that happen on the way. It's related to that, like, would you have a list of tenants to look at if you, if you, like, had this kind of, what is the preparation that needs to happen? You have to kind of find a tenant that you want to yeah. target, or, like, you need to further develop models for the spectra so you kind of know what to look for? I don't, you know... I don't think we necessarily need more time modeling spectra because honestly, until we figure, we measure the spectra, then I'll, that's going to drive a lot of modeling, right? You know, so it's like um, you know the phosphine on Venus controversy, right? You say you've detected it, and then all of a sudden, people are like, "Well, how could that be wrong, right?" And you don't get that sort of flurry of activity until you've made the claim or you've tried to look at the the spectra, right? So I think. Um, of course, there's, you know, I'm a, I'm a theoretician, I'm going to like still want to model a lot of these things, but at some point you need the data and try to figure out what's happening. Um, going back to your other question, what was it before that, though, it was really interesting. Like what do you know what planets look at? Oh yeah, so in specifically the life mission concept, there is a search phase included in that. It'd be great if we could skip it though, because that's two and a half years of the mission lifetime, so if we can just not have us half of the mission lifetime, if we know the targets, then you can detect, you know, 60 to 100 planets, you know, and get a much better answer. So um, that's one hope I have, because these are need to be close planets, whereas Kepler was looking, you know, at a field further away. So we need to be able to have those close habitable planets as, as targets, which I think hopefully we'll get there, but we don't have them now. So that's still um, planned into the mission lifetime. Very good question. Are there any questions online? Is there a chat box? Yeah. No one's paying attention online. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, we are a few minutes past, so if anyone has any questions, you can maybe take one more, or you can continue the conversation. Can we have a show of hands of, of will people still be lonely, or are you super excited about microscopic feelings, or both? Or both. Let's see. Like, who who really wants like something more than microbes? Who who will take microbes? Who is not going to be excited about microbes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be excited about all of them. But yeah, I understand. Any other questions? Maybe if we get to like dog level. <laughs> yeah. right, like, you need to be able to show the pictures on your iPhone. But I don't know. My cat certainly <laughs> cannot tell. Like. My cat does not pass the bear test at all. Just like <laughs> no awareness. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I like who knows, right? But I, I do think there's something to that where, like, we'll still have that existential kind of feeling of like, are we a, are we alone? You know. Um, yet, I think finding microbial life will be then a good place to look for more intelligent signals. Uh, those are actually harder to find, you know, in the spectrum. So like, it could be just a stepping stone to those, hopefully those more advanced uh, uh, signals. All right, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah.